but Mr. Starkweather refuses to comment on these allegations. At this point, it is unclear as to whether or not he will ever be allowed to direct again. This is... You know what? I don't give a fuck what Starkweather wants. Maybe today I kill you, maybe not. Kill the camera. Welcome back to Let's Play Manhunt. Seems our guardian angel has chainsawed us out of another close call. In order to make the best of it, we're gonna have to tool up. And check out our surroundings as we prepare to face down the Cerberus ourselves. Surprisingly easy to get away after opening that door, even though he's right on the other side. I gotta check that out. Got sound lore, so might as well use him. I especially like that they change the sounds that the Cerberus make as you're killing them in the executions. We're going to be seeing a lot of that. It's a very nice attention to detail. Check out our surroundings before we move ahead. And we certainly did not do that ourselves. Nor did we do that. That is the handiwork of one Pigsy. He's on a bit of a killing spree. Getting a good look at what the heavy handgun does. If you land three shots with it from any distance, your target is dead. It's quite a bit better than all the other handguns we've used so far. But of course we don't want to use handguns for this whole stage. We loop around the garage we were brought to. We can find a crowbar. Trusty old crowbar. And there's an old can as well, but I got a better prize in my back pocket. Here's the gate to the estate. No go there. Maybe Pigsy's practice tree. Here's a little uh, shed that we saw Pigsy cutting his way through. Seems on his way out he chucked a guy over his shoulder. At least some of him. Oh, there's more of him. Yeah. He sort of played bear with these guys. This guy over here hasn't moved an inch, despite all the commotion. We're gonna have to see if he ever intends to move an inch for the rest of his life. Nope. 
gave us one of those horrible shotguns with a flashlight on it. But at least we've got some kind of gun in case we need it. A lot of visual cover around here, that's nice. Didn't just drop us into an ambush. And a little bit of shadow out here in the field. Let's see if we can take advantage of it. Using a little trick with the lighted shotgun. You can use the light to lure sufficiently distant enemies to you. These ones are a little too distant, actually. But eventually he turned to find me. Came right over. And interestingly, their own flashlights seem to be pretty much worthless. Now, the two of them are pretty close, so we're going to use a feature of the green weapons, the one-time use ones, that we haven't seen much of so far. Lost him. Repeat, Tango is bugged out. Yeah, because they're both on medium alert and aware of our relatively near presence, we need to make sure we kill them quietly. Hey, Cuckoo, where'd you shrink now? Did you want to get him? And one time use weapons always kill completely silently. Surprising that hasn't been more useful in the past. But because it was so useful here, we were able to execute these two with minimal bodily harm. And here in the rest of the courtyard, Got a replacement glass shard, which again will be used for exactly the same purpose. And a rather distressing statue. It's like a humanoid withered tree. Very hard to get a good angle on it, which is bizarre because clearly a lot of work went into rendering it. Ah, from up here we can overhear some commotion elsewhere. Perhaps Pigsy making a further attack. Let's add to their confusion. Yep, that'll keep him busy over there. That cutscene is just to show us how utterly futile it is to head up that way. And usher us towards this back area. This is where we chuck the head, you can see it off in the distance there. And everyone back here is armed with an assault rifle, the strongest weapon in the game. We want those. So we're going to have to be very careful and not get spotted while we kill these guys. The glass shard is very conducive to that. Because this area is split up by bushes, they tend to separate. Keep it sharp. You can jump out of this any second. Cash is always good at taking advantage of enemies once they've separated. Let's 
So just one left. And even in the worst case, we could just fire on him. more observant than I thought he'd be. But this is the worst case. And there he goes. Did not expect those guys to catch up to me, but... It all turned out alright. Those are the two from the cutscene shown coming down the stairs earlier. I'm gonna want to use the shotgun because we've got limited assault rifle ammo. Sort of reminds me of a hatching egg from Aliens. Maybe the director was rich enough to hire Giger in one of his previous films. That specific guy will never turn in any direction for some reason. He's sort of a freebie. And I will take whatever freebie I can get, because the rest of this area is ridiculously difficult. We're going to see a couple dozen more guys filing out of the upstairs area, near the entrance to the estate. And they're all going to be heavily armed. Luckily, this one is not too concerned about finding the dead body. he becomes an easy execution. He's carrying the heavy handgun himself, which is actually the least dangerous thing the enemies in this area can carry. We started to clear out the maze, but as I said, there's at least a dozen more guys up in the main area, so I want to thin out that herd a little bit, because we're ultimately going to have to deal with all of them. I'm cool. Checking, that's all. The guys right here have assault rifles themselves. That one has taken partial cover, which makes him almost impossible to hit. And of course, when you jump out, you have to worry about the sniper, who is surprisingly accurate. You have to time your pop outs very, very carefully. That went well enough. We took out one guy who had an assault rifle, who are the main targets. We lured out some guys with uh, slightly lesser armaments. Yeah, once they're out of their little area, they're pretty fucked. That guy couldn't actually see us, he was just sort of firing into the distance to uh, scare us away. It's temporarily worked. Now you may have noticed that there is not even a single painkiller pickup in this entire scene. There are, I think, only two enemies who will drop them if you kill them when you're at less than half health. I believe I've already killed both of them. So, to the best of my knowledge, I am at uh, the most amount of health I can be for the rest of this scene. never seem to care about throwing heads. Oh well. If we head over here, we can pretty easily evade their pursuit. Yeah, they're not stepping foot in here. Their pathfinding is surprisingly terrible when it comes to this first floor. Did you get them? Hello? Fucking thing screwed. I got your language, Bravo 2. Oh shit, yes sir. And heading upstairs. 
This is, of course, where the snipers have taken roost. We don't have any executables anymore, so we're gonna have to make do. And Sniper 2. Now it may seem like we've just blown an opportunity to snipe. And we sort of have, but I'll show you why sniping is so futile here. And after you fire a single sniper bullet, this happens anyway. The hounds have come to play! Just make sure if anyone has an assault rifle, you prioritize them. And yeah, as soon as a shot is fired, the whole militia finds their way up here, despite having terrible pathfinding on the first floor. And there we go. Wasn't quite everyone. But here's a sniper rifle with two fucking shots. Wouldn't have even cleared out all the people who ran to find us. And as we try to zoom in, we see nothing but complete blackness. The fog is just too thick. Yep. Very small sphere of influence on our sniper rifle. Pretty much only works if you get right behind one of the guys. As we've done right now. That guy had already been assault rifled to shit. And what I believe to be the very last enemy seemed like he was coming our way. But he got a little uh, scared before he made his way to us. last words. Path seems clear. Heads on pikes. Classic Starkweather move. And right around here is our goal. So there's another scene here in the late game. It seems insurmountable when you first play it, but once you get the hang of it, actually kind of easy. It can be a little unpredictable, as uh, enemies sort of file in from wherever they feel like it. You may fire a shot and not realize that enemies off in the completely opposite direction happen to have heard it and are running your way. And that can lead to you getting pincered and probably killed. And the lack of health pickup seems pretty harsh, but it's ultimately manageable. It's also a fairly fun stage for being mostly shooting. I think it's strongly designed overall. It also crucially brings the journalist, Pigsy, and Cash all together for what can only be Starkweather's downfall. I look forward to seeing what our part in that will be. He's been foreshadowed for some time, but we're finally beginning to see the handiwork of the man who calls himself Pigsy. Although he doesn't appear until late in the game, he has a major impact on the plot and is among the most iconic images to come out of Manhunt. In San Andreas, we saw a mock-up for his action figure alongside one for James Earl Cash, but unlike Cash's figure, the Pigsy figure was actually produced for a limited run of 500 units around the time of Manhunt's release, making them the ultimate collector's item today. Unfortunately, Pigsy does break Manhunt's naming convention, there being no real-life killer who shares his name, but it's hard not to notice the similarity he bears to Leatherface, who also wears a deadskin mask and performs the titular act of the film The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. 
Leatherface and several other iconic film characters, including Norman Bates from Psycho and Buffalo Bill from The Silence of the Lambs, are themselves inspired by the actual killer, Ed Gein. Gein was arrested in 1957 for murdering a local shopkeeper in Plainfield, Wisconsin, whereupon it was discovered that he had used her body, the body of another woman he'd murdered, and numerous bodies stolen from nearby graveyards to make clothing and a variety of household items for his personal use. Gein was said to have donned the skin of dead women so as to become his dearly departed mother, much the way Pigsy wears a severed pig's head and seems to believe he is an actual pig. He is also shown greedily devouring some unknown food, which seems to allude to a nefarious purpose pigs are famously known for, the disposal of human bodies. The book, film, and TV series Hannibal all feature a character named Mason Verger, who specially trains the pigs on his farm to eat the flesh of humans while they are still alive to ensure Hannibal Lecter suffers when Mason gets his revenge. There's also real-life serial killer Belle Gunnis from the early 1900s, who convinced men to bring their life savings to her farm in Indiana with the promise of marriage, but only one of those men ever left alive. About a dozen partial bodies were found buried in her pig pen, with an accomplice claiming that she never bothered to bury the rest of her 40 or more victims after bringing them to the pen. Almost a hundred years later, in 2002, Pig farmer and millionaire Robert Picton from British Columbia, Canada was charged with the murders of 15 prostitutes from Vancouver, which rose to 27 charges after his farm was excavated, although only six of these charges ever led to convictions. Investigators noted that it was difficult to find and analyze the bodies because the pigs had gotten to them, so Picton's own claim of having 49 victims remains unprovable but impossible to rule out. It seems every aspect of Pigsy has some disturbed and horrific implication to it, which is fitting for what is ultimately the embodiment of Manhunt's shameless obsession with violence. <laughs>